Welcome, everyone, to today's episode. And today we have with us Coach Joe Reed. Coach, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself to the listeners for us. Thank you very much, Dennis. My name is Joe Reed. I am a personal trainer and health coach based out of Laguna Hills, California, as well as online. I specialize in working with people in pain. My business is called Train Out of Pain for that reason. I work with people with autoimmune conditions, uh, to severe disabilities, to autonomic nervous conditions. And my specialty is chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Uh, fibromyalgia is a condition that I was officially diagnosed with about five years ago. I had symptoms for about a little over nine years. And I am now almost two and a half years completely symptom-free from fibromyalgia. I mean, all of its symptoms, which is, you know, there's very few of us in the world, which is kind of exciting. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, like I said, I'm a trainer who specializes in people in pain. I also do health coaching with people that have fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. How old were you when you started to get the symptoms of fibromyalgia? Let's see. So if that was 2011, nine years ago, I was 31 years old. Yeah, it was, it was kind of weird where, you know, there was no rhyme or reason why I was in the pain that I was in. I, I had a, a routine blood draw from some blood work and my left arm was, wasn't the same for six and a half years. And doctors would just say, oh, they might've hit a nerve or a vein. You'll be, a, you'll be okay in two to six weeks. It might take a little longer and just never actually got any better. <laughs> so yeah, it was about, it was everyday pain for about six and a half years. And I started having symptoms uh, almost 10 years ago. And that pain, it, it stemmed from the shoulder, but it, I mean, from what I understand with fibromyalgia, it's just amplified pain throughout your whole body, correct? Yeah, you are absolutely correct. Widespread musculoskeletal pain. And as I like to tell all the 30 plus physicians that I saw over the years, it was consistently inconsistent. Um, I might have pain here one day and the next day it's somewhere else. Um, and the way that they kind of determine a fibromyalgia diagnosis is they rule out a lot more serious conditions like MS. And they do a lot of different testing, a lot of lab work, um, nerve conduction testing, MRIs, CT scans, and usually give you some type of a diagnosis like myofascial pain syndrome. Basically saying, yeah, we know you're in pain. We just can't figure out what's happening. But um, with fibromyalgia, there's usually a very specific tender point test. There's 18 specific points where if you have 11 out of 18, then you would normally get that diagnosis from a rheumatologist. Well, when I went to the rheumatologist, I had 18 out of 18. Ooh, My whole body was like that. And he says, you know, I think you have fibromyalgia. I just don't want to give you that diagnosis yet. And it took another probably three years before I officially got that diagnosis from the fourth neurologist that I actually saw. So it was, it was, it's, a, it's a condition that's widely misunderstood. That's a condition that a lot of physicians still deny actually exists, even though there is an abundance of scientific literature on the subject. Um, I talk to people all around the world who have fibromyalgia pretty consistently, and you'd be surprised by how many physicians deny that this is an actual real diagnosis these days. It's it's frightening. We were looking up some background on fibromyalgia, and you said that in the U.S. there was they were saying yep. how many people? Four million people. Yep. yep, and it affects mostly women. That's oh, interesting because yeah. yeah, I've had two female clients that have suffered from fibromyalgia. So one, hearing your story and your experience, I was we were really eager to get you on because it is such an unknown entity to deal with. Right. From our, especially from our industry, right? Agreed. So that's kind of where my head went was, I don't see that there's anybody that specializes with this specific condition. And just knowing that in the US alone, we have you know, 4 million people that suffer from this. There's a wide amount of people, a huge population that have this condition around the world, even mm -hmm. that they're just kind of left to their own devices. Doctors tell them two things, which every one of my doctors said, you need to supplement with vitamin D and you need to exercise. But what they don't tell you is how to exercise. Yeah. And then what happens is most of us, we go into the gym like I did. I used to be a big hiker. I wanted to get back to hiking mountains. And I was on the treadmill and doctor said, you know what? You're going to get used to that really quick. Go into the gym and lift weights. Cool. Great idea. Well, what I remember from high school were bodybuilding exercises. And I have a gym in my apartments that has furnished uh, a bunch of machines. So I went in there, started lifting on the machines. And the next thing you know, I'm in the gym for two and a half hours. And I'd be in bed for a week because of it. Because most of us, if, if you don't have that experience in the industry, or if you haven't have an, if you were never an athlete, or you didn't get trained in any type of exercise movement, most of us know bodybuilding. And unfortunately, for people with fibromyalgia, that is a great way to make somebody feel really bad. From my standpoint, it's about you know more movement, different movement, about you know working with all three planes of motion, get them out of the sagittal plane, especially moving up and down and forward and backwards, and 
The other part of that is, is the majority of people that have this condition are extremely sedentary. Of course they are. They're in pain. Mm-hmm. They have this unexplained pain everywhere. So I saw that this was a, a great opportunity for me to really help the people that I can connect with at a very deep level because of my story. I not only can offer them my experience, my expertise, and my education, but now I can offer them my empathy as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I saw that this was a, a niche that really, there was nobody else doing this. So from my standpoint, a movement and exercise are two different things. I really concentrate on movement for people who have fibromyalgia. And, you know, another one of my mentors has really drove the fact home as he works with a lot of people with chronic pain that, you know, it's about different movement. And that's how I've seen the, the most progressions from people that have any type of chronic pain condition, especially like fibromyalgia. I look at one of my clients specifically who, you know, she had tried going to the gym. She went to the big corporate box gym and she tried all the machines and said, Joe, it just made me feel worse. And then she tried dumbbells and she tried some free weights and then she tried Pilates and all these different things. She never felt she always just felt worse. So she came to me, she said, Joe, I just need some different ideas. And you work with a friend of mine who you know, has some pretty serious chronic pain. And I think that you can help her. She came in and sure enough, gave her some different ideas about exercise for fibromyalgia because the traditional body weight, the traditional, uh, you know, Olympic lifting, you know, any of those types of things are just, they're going to be a big detriment for somebody who's in a lot of pain aside from having to learn a new skill. And that's another part of it where they have brain fog. And if you don't know what brain fog is, it You basically lose your track of thought within the middle of a sentence. You forget who you're talking to and it happens consistently. So I need to make sure that it's an easy process for somebody to understand a movement. I have to make it that it's accessible for them, depending upon what their their physical abilities are. And if you're coming in, if you have fibromyalgia, that's a whole different ballgame where you're going to have to look at where is this person hurting? You're going to have to look at, is that something that's consistent? Is it something that is just coming in today? For instance, when somebody comes in to see me after a greeting, the very first thing that comes out of my mouth is, how's your body feeling today? Because as much as I have a plan, as much as I have my program written for that person, as soon as they come in, you know, Joe, this doesn't feel good. That program goes in the trash. And I have to have that skill set and that ability level to be able to be flexible with my clientele so that I can meet them where they are so they can still come in and improve even if they're not feeling their best that day. Now that's all I want to work with are, are the people that are the hopeless, the ones that are helpless, the ones that have been through PT, they've gone to see your Cairo, they've been to other trainers and they couldn't improve. I want to be that last line where they hear about some crazy trainer named Joe who does a bunch of weird stuff, but it gets results with people that are in pain. And that's kind of where I am right now too. You know, it's, I have this, uh, this designation for my clients, but you know, it's, it's a, uh, where it has a badge of pride that, you know, I'm, I'm really the last person that these people see. I take a lot of pride of being an extreme outlier in the fitness industry because, you know, most people are looking for fat loss goals. They're looking for muscle gain. They're looking to get strength, They're looking to move better. I found, I fell in love with kettlebells originally because my hips and my hands were the worst part of my body, but I also killed myself with kettlebells to the absolute detriment to myself. And now, you know, a few years in, I have the same goals as my clients do where I just want to feel good. I want to move well. I want to be strong enough to be able to do whatever I want physically, but I don't have aesthetic goals like my clients do. I remember my clients don't either. My clients don't have fat loss goals normally. It allows me to create a very intimate relationship that I can affect them at a deeper level than just um, an outside layer to them, which then is going to have a cascade effect upon their mental being as well. You know, because Another part of this is the depression and anxiety that a lot of people feel. Um, This is, this is the stuff that gets me really emotional when I talk about it. Unfortunately, people with fibromyalgia, they are not supported by family and friends a lot of the time, even by their physicians as well. And I think about this woman named Sophie, who I talked to two months ago from the UK. And I was on the verge of tears because she was telling me, you know, Joe, I had to stop working. I don't have any support from family or friends. My friends and my family think that I'm lazy. And they tell me that I need to get over it and just get back to work. And I can't tell you how many, talk to, how many people I talk to about this. And it's the same thing. And um, that really inspired me to want to help people in another way too. So I created a fibromyalgia support group online for just that reason, where if we're not going to talk about medications, we're going to talk about symptoms. We're there to just support each other in a loving, kind, positive fashion. So I created this Facebook group called um, You Are Not Alone. It's a a fibromyalgia support group because I keep hearing about all these people who don't have the support. So I'm all about tying the community of fibromyalgia together. I see this as a huge opportunity where not only are there's, there's nobody out there doing what I'm doing, but I see that these people are helpless. They're alone and they're feeling these ways. And the exercise and movement can help them with one part of it that can 
allow them to feel better in the rest of their life. But now we got to also take care of the community part too. So I'm just trying to bring the whole fibromyalgia community together. I have this crazy goal of helping a million people over the next 20 years. And I can't do that working one-on-one. I created my first fibromyalgia movement program and it's a, it's a nine month program. There is no gym. There is no equipment required. All you need is some dedication and you're ready to go. It's a nine month program with 213 movements without a single gym or any other equipment that you need. I have that on the dock. I have my first book, which I've been writing about fibromyalgia, where I'm not a doctor, I'm not a PhD, but I'm also citing 75 research papers to give some validity to my claim. So I have some resources for you. And then the last part of that puzzle is I'm also going to be creating a, a course for clinicians and physicians and therapists, which you know trainers are going to fall into that umbrella as well. It's going to be an all-encompassing program that teaches you about all the things that I've learned to completely eradicate fibromyalgia from my life. There's going to be the movement part of it. There's going to be start a part on diet, going to be a part on biology, because that's really what I've learned about the most is human biology and the way that we function and the ways that our current lifestyle and our modern environment have really reduced our abilities to function as a normal human being, which then creates a lot of illness like fibromyalgia. So I'm going to have some resources for people so other trainers can figure out ways to help people. Like granted, you guys are good at what you do. You're trainers. This is what we do. We figure out ways to to solve a problem for somebody, right? But when you have somebody that comes in with a a physical limitation like fibromyalgia, especially when, if they're anything like I was, it's different every single day. You've got to have another toolbox to be able to help those people, right? So me creating all of these things is me giving back to the world so that more people can understand at a deeper level about this condition. So not only are they going to their doctors now, now their massage therapist can help them out or their trainer can help them out or their PT can help them out or their chiro. So out of the movements that you're doing, when doctors or clinicians tell people with fibromyalgia to go work out, what, what would be first primary focus from that physical exercise standpoint? I look at the human development pattern specifically between six months and 13 months is kind of the foundation of what I do movement wise with people. I look at it that way because it's accessible for the overwhelming population of people, you know, whether you're in a wheelchair or you're a fully functioning person, it is something that we have all had that design in us from infancy. So that childhood development is the, the probably the biggest foundation of what I do because again, you don't need equipment. Um, the place that I work the most is on the floor just to give the brain safety for, you know, for example, that's, that's really the biggest thing that I do. Neuroscience also has a huge part of what I do with people because of the whole pain part of it. And I want to reduce the, the pain. I want to reduce the threat that the brain feels by just getting them on the floor, letting their brain feel safe by the amount of skin they have in contact. The other thing is because of the people that I work with, they're usually sitting in bed most day, most of the day, honestly, that's what most people are doing. They want to be as comfortable as possible. And I realized that because I did the same thing. So I can't just, you know, throw them into a a normal training program. It's not going to work. Not only are they sedentary, but they hurt, right? So I have to ease them into certain types of movements. And I find that the ground is the best place to transition for them because they're able to, um, they're able to find new ranges of motion that they normally don't have. They're able to be not only more mobile, they're more stable when they need to be. And they can find strength easier on the floor than they can standing without tools, I use, you know, body weight and gravity are my number one tools and everybody improves within three weeks. I have a client who's been with me for three years. We've probably lifted 12 times in that three years. Everything else has been body weight. She's in her early sixties with severe osteoporosis. She now at 62 can get to the bottom of the squat with no issues. She does things like Turkish get-ups with ease and she has the balance of a 10 year old. So it's having the toolbox that can show the people how we can get better without using tools, really. That's, you know, I want the ground to be a safe place for people, not only because it's going to allow them to move better, but I also want that to be a place that's not foreign to them as they age, as you guys very well know, work in this industry, falls happen, falls hurt. And then within about a year and a half time, most people are dying from that. And I work with a lot of seniors. So I want that to be a, a place that they're very familiar with. I want that to be a place that they're comfortable with. And I want to make sure that every single client, regardless of age, every single client that I work with, I want them to be able to get up and down from the ground on their own because from my standpoint, there's a few markers of longevity. You know, there's some traditionally like grip strength, glute strength, ab strength. But for me, if you can't get up and down from the ground, 
that's compromising your health significant. I, I put everybody on the ground and even in my assessment, it's in there, you know, and I've had only a couple people that we couldn't get down on the ground in their assessment, but I always have a goal for those people, you know, in a specific amount of time, we're going to be able to get you down the floor. When it comes to actual lifting of weights or external mm-hmm. loads, so obviously that's something that you wait a long time to implement in, if if not at all sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I'll load certain patterns like the gate pattern um, with the farmer's carry or suitcase carry. That's probably the one pattern I will load pretty early on if they have a gate pattern that will allow them to do it and they have the balance for it, which I've only had a couple that have it. So it's not that I don't use load. It's not that I avoid it. I just find that for most of my clientele, keeping them working with their own body, um, having them develop physical competency with their body, having them develop body awareness, having them develop uh, proprioception and those types of things are far more valuable than load, where load can um, help them get stronger, but I can do that with other things too, like tempo. We can use tempo really easily to, to load the body in a safe way that allows them to not be very sore. And the biggest thing, again, is for them to adapt much faster. And, you know, I take a lot of pride in being able to meet people where their physical abilities are. And unfortunately, for people with fibromyalgia, majority of them are going to be sedentary. They haven't been in the gym. They haven't been moving. They haven't been doing anything. So load for me is just, it's an afterthought. It's about, you know, showing them how they can move their bodies, showing them that they can control their bodies, showing them they can become more mobile. And then once they start to realize those things and I see a, a progression and I feel that their their movement patterns are great, then we can start to load those things safely. When was it in you, your own training timeline that you figured out like, hey, you know what, this movement variability, body weight training is is the direction I need to go? You know, I think that for me, it was... A couple of years ago, um, what my, my colleague and good friend turned me on to gold medal bodies. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and I just, I said, you know, I just wanted, I was getting bored with kettlebells. You know, it's, it's just extensive. I, I've been going nonstop really hard for a long time. And I just wanted to try something. And it's not that I didn't feel well with kettlebells, but I knew that there was potential to feel even better. And um, after doing my first uh, GMB program, man, what a difference in my mobility and the way that I moved. And the biggest thing was I felt great. I didn't have that, man, I just did a 15 minute kettlebell complex. I feel like I'm going to puke for the rest of the day and can barely wash my hands feeling. I felt great and I wasn't very sore. And then I saw that my adaptation was just so fast where within a six week program, I had progressed a few of the movements several times. And I thought that looks really great. And I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. So I spent the, the majority of the last two years doing some type of calisthenics or body weight or gymnastics training. And now I think I do two lifts, maybe not three lifts. And, and for the last two years, I've probably only done Turkish get-up swings and a squat here and there. And everything else has been calisthenics and gymnastics and body weight. And you know, like these days I'm doing a ton of like round offs and a lot of handstand practice and you know, mixing in like you know, crow and you know, all that type of type of stuff. But I found that I'm not only stronger than I've ever been. I feel better than ever. So it's been a, you know, the past two years has been a real adventure going down the calisthenics, body weight, gymnastics stuff. And, you know, even though I'm 42 and, and gym, doing gymnastics at this age, it's a lot of my clients think it's silly, man, it feels great. It feels really cool. I feel like a 10 year old a lot of the time because, you know, this is stuff that guys at our age really aren't doing a lot of, right? No. So I just thought it was really interesting. And then the fact that it made me feel good and then I got stronger and I had all these gains. And for me, it's just, I want to feel well. I don't like being really sore you know, I don't have these aesthetic goals. So I'm not, I'm not in the gym trying to deadlift 500 pounds. You know, I'm not looking for anything like that. Or I just want to feel well, move well. And I, now it's like, I come into the gym and, you know, you know, I'm a really busy, like, man, I can't wait to get to my session. It's a, it's a short 30 minute session. I'm going to feel great. And I'm still going to, you know, get everything that I want in. And I'm still going to get all these gains. And by the end of it, it's, it's just what I need, you know, now after trying to do all these different things and from my clientele's standpoint as well, it's the things that they can do at home. It's the things they don't have to come into the gym for. And it's the things that are just very accessible. And then they learn these skills and they go home and they teach their, their spouses and they teach their kids, which is really fun. Um, just one more thing about that. I have, um, I have a couple of clients that are not in pain. My youngest client is nine years old and he's the most fun by the way. And one of the things that we do at the end of the session was we play a movement memory game and, you know, we'll just, I'll do a movement that he does and adds a layer and we just go back and forth. And it's the most fun play for me is great. And, and the body weight stuff is, it's everything. For me. I don't ever want to go back to, to training like I used to. <laughs> yeah. We love the play aspect because 
if you were to just take a video and watch all the different shapes and positions you got into when you're, you're doing these games, like Dennis and I will play these evasion games with a stick, right? Yeah. You're trying to hit each other and you, you try to dodge it. You know, you're ducking, you're rolling, you're getting on your side, you're, su- you're, you're rotating, you're bending, and you're loading all these different directions, you know, without even knowing it, everyone's laughing, having fun, and then you're sweating, you're breathing hard. So yeah, I, I mean, I think the play is really valuable. Extraordinarily. And I tell all my clients, you know, I tell them right off the bat, we're going to play at some point. We don't every session, we're going to play. And they kind of look at me sideways, like play, what does that even mean? And then I remind them, you stop playing around 12 or 13, because it was no longer cool. You know, you wanted to be an adult, <laughs> you know, at 12 or 13, you didn't want to be a kid anymore. And play was no longer cool. So we stopped moving. We stopped doing all the things that we had fun that we enjoyed when we were kids. And then next thing you know, you're moving like crap. And I tell my clients, I said, I guarantee you that when we play, you will not feel any pain. And every single person has that same experience because they're not thinking about that pain anymore. They're not concentrating on that pain anymore. They're now smiling, having a good time. Like you're saying, their their heart rate has gone up. They might be sweating a little bit. And then at the end, like, wait, I just felt good for a minute. And I was moving and exercising too. Like, what's going on here? This doesn't seem right. But like, like you said, like play for me is, it's the game changer for a lot of people too. Well, society tells us we're supposed to act a certain way. Uh, sure. We're supposed to have a certain standard of decorum when we get to a certain age, you know? Even as adults, you're walking through the parking lot, try to stay on the lines that are drawn in the parking lot. Just silly stuff like that challenges your skill levels just through mundane daily tasks that we have to do, right? Absolutely. And we don't think about that stuff either. (laughs) Right? It's a great point. Even with the lines, that's a great point that we don't think about. Oh, yeah. I'd like to walk route, you know, whenever I see stuff, I'll just try to balance walk certain things just randomly through the parking lot, making sure I don't get hit by a car. But, (laughs) but I'm still, I'm doing this stuff just to just periodically throughout the day, just see, can I do this? You know, if there's elevated walkway or railing, can I walk on that for a substantial distance? Mm -hmm. I have that skill, right? I'm right there with you. That's that's stuff I challenge myself with all the time because it's fun too. Same along the similar lines, I have these wooden posts around my apartments and they're raised up at all different levels and they're really small, really small footprint. I get out there barefoot and try to just walk along all of them as long as I can forward, backwards, as many ways. First of all, it's and it's a great challenge where it's not in the gym. It's not a, a gym focused exercise. It's just me being a human being and, and moving. Around. And I think that if we as adults introduce more of that into our everyday lives, man, we wouldn't take ourselves as seriously. We'd be moving better. We'd all be feeling better and probably laugh. Very true. So for me, one of my clients, the one lady that had fibromyalgia that I trained with, she was in pain, but she also was high gear. Like she wanted to lift weight. She wanted to do things. What's your advice to kind of real? How do you reel somebody in like that, that may be their own worst enemy? That's a tough one, really. Um, I was that way too, where if I felt good, it was gas pedal down to the floor and I was my own worst enemy and I couldn't get on my own way. That's the unfortunate part about training people with fibromyalgia. If they feel good, they're going to push it and you can't do anything about it. Honestly, you can't because it's, if it's a good day, you want to push things because most days you're not going to be able to. Right? From my standpoint with that, um, like for my, my program, there's three levels of physical competency as far as I'm concerned with fibromyalgia. Level one is somebody that is sedentary, that is not exercising, that may have tried to exercise, and overdid it, and found themselves in bed and is, is pretty apprehensive and scared to train. Level two is somebody that is exercising on a consistent basis that may still find themselves having some type of a flare up, whether that be pain, fatigue, or whatever, that is open to trying some new exercises. Level three, and I've only met a couple of these people with fibromyalgia, is somebody that is not feeling any deleterious effects in their body from lifting, exercising, whatever it may be. Uh, For instance, I talked to a woman in New York probably six months ago who um, I asked her what her favorite exercise was. She said, back squats. I said, I'm sorry? (laughs) Back squat. <laughs> yeah, fibro. I don't back squat. Like, I don't have any need for it. I just don't do it. She goes, no, it's my favorite exercise. And I feel great afterwards. So, well, how do you feel the next couple of days? She goes, no, I feel fine. So that's somebody again, very rare. No breaks on that person. As long as they feel well, perfect to do whatever. The minute that they feel a flare up from an exercise or a movement pattern, whatever it may be, you might have to then have that come to Jesus talk and just say, Hey, you know, 
you, you weren't able to come in the next day, whatever that was, whatever it was, you know, talk about, you know, um, I saw that you missed your next session because you were in bed because you pushed that exercise too much or you pushed the weight. That's when about the only time you can really interject because you're not going to be able to tell anybody anything when they're feeling good. That's just the truth of the matter. Mm -hmm. When, you know, granted, when I was at a, a, my former, when I was training at a, a kettlebell studio, the, the gym owner, he knows about fibromyalgia. His mom has it. So he'd always ask me, Joe, how are you feeling today? And if I said anything other than good, he'd say, don't push it today. And I could never wrap my head around. I'm like, what do you mean? Don't push it. I just walked into the gym. Like I'm here to crush and lift everything in the world. Mm -hmm. But it was that mentality of, Hey, you don't have to lift everything in the world. That was what it took me a while to wrap my head around. But once I got that, that allowed me to continue to train without hurting myself or ending up in bed because I pushed it too much. So it's, it's a fine line. You got to walk as a, as a coach and as a trainer, it's going to be really hard to have that conversation with a person to, to, to rein them in or to, to have them dial it back because if they feel good, they're going to want to press it. But for the most part, they're also going to be their own worst enemy too. So there's probably going to be an opportunity for you to interject to say, Hey, no, let's think about training a little bit smarter instead of just harder all the time. Because I think that it doesn't, then it's never a linear progression. It has to be cyclical. But also when it comes to somebody like that, they have to have that in their head that it's never just this. And when you come to the gym, it's just to crush it. There has to be different goals outside of just strength, outside of just, hey, I'm here. I want to lift everything. I get that. But you have to have that ability to be able to tell them, hey, you know what? Let's try something else. I think this will benefit what you're doing there. If you can do that, you'll be golden. Should coaches or trainers who have a client with autoimmune autoimmune issues, should they really be spending just more time discussing with the client, not just about weights, about working out, but actually just about what their daily experiences or daily life situation is like? Yes. I think that's a really important thing to know. I can't speak for every trainer because um, you know, we're all different, but you know, I take all those things into consideration, especially with their, their everyday life, because you're going to have to, um, especially when these, when these types of conditions arise. I think that a lot of people when they feel terrible and they have autoimmune conditions or some type of chronic fatigue or chronic pain condition, whatever it may be, their inclination is to be as comfortable as possible. And I get it because they feel so terrible. And going to the gym is them really getting outside of their comfort zone too, for most people, especially if they don't feel well. So you need to take into consideration their, everything else they're doing. Because if they're going to the gym, they're probably going to be in a better mood. They're putting on their best face because they're trying to put in the effort because they know that they're going to get something out of this and there's tremendous value behind it. But we're not taking into consideration the other things that are happening behind the scenes. Um, most of us know that emotions take some part into the body and they can affect us physically. But a lot of us don't realize that somebody with an autoimmune condition or someone with a chronic pain condition, they're at level 10 with all those things that every single day, their, their sympathetic nervous system is just driven through the roof. And very rarely do they know how to bring it back down. So I think that the most valuable thing for coaches and trainers is to take all those things into consideration and have those talks with them that shows them not only you care, but gives them different ideas of how they can get out of their own way. Include things like mobility in their programs. Even if they'd like, no, I just want to lift. I feel good. I want to lift everything. Cool. We're going to lift, but we're going to also do this on the backside too introduce them to new things, introduce them to concepts about self-care. Because as much as I'd like to say that people that don't feel good are into self-care, a lot of them aren't. And a lot of them don't practice self-care, nor do they invest in the body uh, in their own bodies. So as long as you can take those things into consideration, see where you might be able to impact their stress levels in their everyday life. I think that's a really valuable thing that you, you brought up there, Dennis. So how much of a focus in your program is breathing, you know, because you can calm down the nervous system and huge. Um, it's actually a, it's a funny thing is even in my, my fibromyalgia program, the first level that everybody starts with, which there's a, it's a 12 week program every single day, there's three days a week, every single day begins and ends with breathing. I think it's not only, not only important for the sympathetic nervous system and, and to drive the parasympathetic, but for me, which I'm sure you guys also, there's no movement quality if you can't breathe. No, yeah. And that is just a fundamental piece of what I do with people. And, you know, they always say, you know, Joe, I'm breathing. It's like, no, you're respirating. You're not breathing. You're not putting that thought <laughs> into it, right? So, and then, you know, there's no, Joe, this is really easy. Sure. But here's the thing. That's where I, I make everybody see how important it is. During my consultation with them, I usually 
tell them about what I do. And then there's like, oh, you do baby stuff. Okay. I'm an adult. That's not going to work for me. And I say, you know what? I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm just going to show you. Mm-hmm. And the very first thing I have them do is some diaphragmatic breathing. I have them do some type of a, a physical test, some type of biofeedback test, and they breathe. And guess what? It always gets better. And then I tell them, okay, so all you do is breathe. Whatever you just did got better. We didn't stretch. Or do you see now that breathing might be important? Because people don't understand that it is the absolute fundamental of everything. The, when I talk, uh, when I do my social media posts and I say the most important exercise for fibromyalgia is breathing. Mm. I get flack for it. Joe, this isn't an exercise. Like, let's talk about your diaphragm and how you're not using it, right? So it's it's the absolute foundation of everything that I do is, is, is right around breathing because it's funny when we introduce people to new movement patterns, what do they do? They hold their breath, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So everybody that I come in, they're already in pain. Now they're learning a new movement pattern. Now they're learning a new skill and their brain is freaking out. And the first thing they're going to do is stop breathing. So before I even introduce them to a moving movement pattern, the first thing I do is says, this is your breathing pattern for this movement, because there's such an emphasis on breathing for what I do, whether it be the exercise or driving the parasympathetic. And it's, I guess it's a nice way to assess if someone's ready to move on to the next level is, Hey, how are they breathing through this movement? And you know, if it's, if it's they're holding their breath too much or they're breathing too hard, it's like, all right, you need to stay here for a little bit until we can progress, you know, get the movement to look really good. And then we'll move on from here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's even in my assessment, you know, it's the smallest part of it, but it's there for a reason because I mean, and that's the thing is the overwhelming majority of people are going to have some pretty significant breathing issues, right? Most people are chest breathers. Most people are mouth breathers. So if I come in here and I tell you, I want to see you breathe with your mouth closed and it looks like a struggle. And by the end, why is that so hard? Man, we got some work to do, right? You know, it's, it's, it's that important. And I, and as you guys well know, as we just talked about, it can make a huge change in a movement pattern instantly for somebody. Cause you're trying to teach them that if you get into a position and you stop breathing, it's your body going into a panic state. Essentially it's freaking out. Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I introduce that concept to my clients as much as I can about threat to the brain mm-hmm. and the, all the different ways that the brain perceives threat. And one of the reasons why um, I have my clients come in barefoot is so that their brain can feel a little bit safer just from getting more sensory input from the bottom of their feet. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm all about safety for them. And I, I want to, them to understand that, you know, this might be some type, type of a woo woo concept for a lot of people, but it is fundamentally true and that we need to, tell you about threat. We need to tell you about why your brain does this, why your body reacts in this way, because it's one thing for me to teach somebody and for them to do it, but it's another thing for me to educate them. And I think it's an important part of what we do to educate people, because I think that when somebody leaves, they need to have their own toolbox that you have shown them, that you have taught them so that if something happens, they're going, you know what? Joe taught me this. I'm going to try that and see if it makes any difference in the way that I feel. Right. So I think that that education part of it is crucial. And especially with the pain consideration, I had no idea when I was in pain, how crappy I moved and that I moved that way because of the threat that my brain felt from a multitude of things. So when I have a client come in and they, they recognize it, why did I stop breathing? Well, let's sit down and talk about it for a minute, because I think it's that important for them to understand that concept. That is so completely foreign for most of us. I think even across medical practitioners can be too, where whether it be a PT, a Cairo, or even an MD, they might not even recognize like, hey, you went and you did it, you worked what? And you stopped breathing? They might not even recognize it. So I think the education for them to rec- for them so that they can recognize, especially if they're doing things at home on their own, they have great body awareness. Oh, wow. I just stopped breathing. Why? Oh, yeah. Dennis just taught me about this threat response that I had and why I went into this coiled position is the fetal position or whatever it may be. I think that's imperative stuff. Wow. That was, a, that was awesome. I pre- we appreciate you coming on, brother. That was great stuff, man. Well, I appreciate you having uh, me on. Where is your, so where can people find your programming or social media? All social media. I'm trained out of pain. It's O U T T A, not out of pain, but out of pain all across social media the website is train out of pain. Um, you can reach me at Joe at trainoutofpain.com. Again, training people um, in Laguna Hills, California, as well as online all around the world. Um, I've had clients in the UK, Canada, you name it. So I'm, I'm ready to help people if they want my help. Well, there's a lot of people because if we got if we got 4 million people in the US, <laughs> yep. that means we're upwards of 20 plus million around the world. Easy, right? 
Absolutely, so, man. And yeah, that's, that's a large demographic. And I think that's what we, as an industry, I think we, we lose sight of the context of the numbers that we talk about, right? Because you say 4 million people, if you just say that to somebody, they're going to be like, that's a lot of people. And so, but I think as an industry, we look at overall percentages of it and we go, oh, well, it's just a small amount. And we kind of push them to the periphery and we ignore them. Uh, but if people like yourself, if coaches like yourself understand that this is a vast group of demographic of people that need our help and need our assistance, right? Yep. And that's, that's what I'm here for. I, I mean, I've worked with professional athletes. I've worked with collegiate athletes, high level athletes. They're so much fun. There's nothing like having a, my client come in here and say, Joe, you changed my life. That's awesome. I can't tell you how many clients I have cried my eyes out and I have no shame in saying that it's um, a huge point of pride for me that not only can I affect people in a very deep way with their physical bodies, but a very intimate, deep relationship with my clients because I understand where they've been. You know, we might have some uh, difference in our physical abilities in the past. We might have a different diagnosis. I've fallen five times, been unable to cut up my own food. I lost all my physical abilities by the age of 37. I know what it's like. So I, I, I can help people in a very intimate, in a very intimate way and I can change their lives for the rest of their lives. That's awesome, That's awesome. brother. Well, thank you, Joe. I hope uh, you know this podcast can help your program grow too. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah. I appreciate you asking me to come on, and uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to my story and for me to talk about fibromyalgia. It really means a lot. Yeah, Absolutely. you're welcome. And uh, next time we're down in the LA area, we'll have to meet up and uh, absolutely talk some shop and just hang out, brother. Right? Yeah. Please, please. It's my favorite thing to do. Awesome. Sounds good, buddy. Well, thank you everyone for jumping in and listening to this episode. Definitely think there's a lot of value in this episode. So until next time, be good to each other.